Saul. It's an honor to be here, and thank you very much for this uh, very important invitation. Um, I know the uh, JNF for quite a while. I've been working uh, with you guys uh, the last uh, almost uh, three years. I mean, the, from the minute that I've resigned from uh, uh, the Mossad that was in the, the midst of, uh, of uh, 2021, in the middle of the year. Um, and it's a, again, it's a great honor, and I think it is, it's going to be an important um, a discussion between us. I hope that I, I could elaborate to the questions that you will be interested to, um, uh, to be answered, I mean, later in the show. Um, but anyhow, I'd, I'd love to start with, um, with, with a big question that um, has been uh, eventually asked every time that we start any kind of session like that. Uh, and um, how come? How did it happen to us? What went wrong on the Israeli Defense Forces and the Israeli Intelligence Forces? What went wrong? And this is something that, of course, is very hard to explain. But I wanted to refer, I mean, and, and you said correctly, uh, so that I've served as the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister and the head of the National Security Council for almost two and a half years. And what is a national security uh, for the state of Israel? What are the assets of a national security beside the civil part, beside the civic part? Beside the things that were, are connected directly and indirectly to our society, I want to refer to the defense, um, um, two lines of defense, actually. The first line of defense, uh, which is very well known to you, um, but not normally, I would say, everybody uh, in the audience do understand what is the intelligence line of defense for a country. And this has to be eventually... Um, explained when we start to understand what has went wrong or what went so wrong. The first line of defense, which I call the uh, intelligence line of defense, is the line that the security services of each nation is trying to get together um, as much as intelligence as we can to provide our leaders, to provide our country, to provide the defense forces with an alert of what's going to happen to us. Is it going to be an army that is going to attack the state? Is it going to be terror organizations that is going to attack the state? Is it going to be a sole uh, terrorist that is traveling from uh, Mosul in Iraq to Paris uh, to try to attack our embassy? Uh, or is it going to be um, a, a, I would say, an Islamic uh, radicalist guy uh, sitting in Berlin, traveling all the way to Turkey, to Istanbul, to to um, to attack our our synagogue or the um, the current uh, uh, Jewish community in Istanbul, for example? These are cases that I've been working with uh, for so many years, and this is the line of defense. What does it mean, the line of defense? When you see and you work intensively on gathering this kind of intelligence on daily basis, again and again and again, you want to believe that there are two things that you can predict. One is the enemy deeds, and the, the second thing is, can we do something to interrupt? Can we do something to disrupt uh, the enemy's uh, uh, wishes or plans? And this is something that has to go together all the time, definitely when you are and, uh, and, and operating with the Mossad I mean, for so many years, and when you are not only national security advisor, but director of the Mossad, this is something that is absolutely at your agenda, trying to understand what the Iranians are planning for us, what Hamas is planning for us, what the Islamic Jihad is planning for us, what the other nations that are seeing us as their enemy um, are planning for us. And when we see that, let's say for the biggest story of our life, I mean, the Iranian nuclear uh, capabilities, the other action that, what, that we do and the other action that we have to do based on the intelligence that we have to disrupt their deeds, we have to disrupt their uh, their planning, we have to disrupt what they wish to do in order to damage either the state, the state of Israel in that case, or the Jewish communities, even in the USA and of course outside of Israel all over. So this line of defense, unfortunately, collapsed. And this is something that um, brought us to the um, to this situation that when when the first line of defense collapses and you do not disrupt what you see because you misconcepted or you mislearned about the enemy uh, plans, this is something 
um, devastating. This is something terrible. I mean, to a country, to to any organization. So this is the first line of defense that I I wanted to refer to. Then I go to the second line of defense. Second line of defense has to be the one that does not take under consideration the intelligence. Meaning, you have to assume definitely when you are an intelligence officer, and, and probably some of you have learned or worked with intelligence forces sometime, you have to know that you don't know. You have to know that you don't know everything. You have to assume, you have to assume that you do have many gaps or some gaps in your intelligence big pictured puzzle. And then, and therefore, you have to make sure that the second line of defense, which is the physical line of defense, i.e. the IDF in our case, is well placed in our borders to make sure that if something wrong will happen, if something wrong has been translated by us, we will be ready to forecast or to welcome, in simple words, any of the enemy deeds. Unfortunately, and I'm speechless, these two lines, the intelligence line of defense and the physical line of defense have collapsed simultaneously. This is eventually uh, something that I believe in our, uh, I would say military intelligence culture will be uh, deeply investigated by the country. I am absolutely cherishing a kind of a very deep committee um, that will investigate what has happened because for me, um, and, and I was asked many times about, about this, what do I think, what do I feel? I, I'm shocked. I'm absolutely shocked. Like I believe all Jewish people are and all Israelis are that it was possible that these two lines have collapsed simultaneously and brought us to October 7th. Out of the 520 um, soldiers that we've lost, commanders, officers, um, I've lost two cousins too. One uh, fighting in Kibbutz Berry, uh, the same uh, Saturday of the seventh itself and another um, officer one of my dearest cousins that we've lost um, inside gaza strip um, when his uh, armored vehicle was attacked by an rpg um, and this price that we're paying um, as sol correctly said uh, is the highest price that the state of israel is sacrificing um, for um, for the uh, I would say the the, the peace um, or the peaceful life that we're cherishing so much and that we are dearing so much uh, that will get back, I believe, to what we call the Otef Aza, the wrapping um, uh, settlements that are wrapping the the state, uh, uh, the the Gaza Strip, and and of course part of part of the countries. Unfortunately. Um, you're all absolutely aware of that, and I know that you're hosting uh, the families of the hostages. Um, brutally, Hamas not only butchered, killed, beheaded uh, from babies um, up to, I mean, elderly people, but they've kidnapped so many of us. Um, most of them are still there. Most of them are still there. Some of them are known to us as um, not living, unfortunately, anymore not alive anymore, and some of them are alive. I think this is something that has to be uh, reminded uh, tonight or today, in your case, is that the state of Israel is um, making a lot of efforts to make sure that these hostages, all of them, will come home, back to Israel, the sooner the better. We know that they're being kept um, in super tough conditions. Uh, winter has just uh, um, started a few weeks ago. It's getting very cold, and I believe that in the tunnels that they're being kept in, um, the conditions are, are terrible. The, the only one thing that we do care about is that we will make sure that all hostages will be home and will be home soon. Today, sometime in the morning, I was interviewed by and Israeli radio, and there were, and I was asked, I mean, a lot of very tough and difficult questions. What's going to be the size of of the giveaways that we have to 
um, to forgive ourselves or we have to trade, sorry to say, uh, for the hostages. So, I mean, it's important to remember that on, on one hand, there is a moral Israel, there is a moral country, a liberal and, and, and our beauty, beautiful democracy is loving kicking. But on the other hand, we're dealing with a satanic, um, a terrible, uh, horrifying uh, terror organization. I mean, these two values cannot get together. So when we trade with these evil people, we have all the time to make sure that we don't give too much um, of, of what we can't um um give but we give enough so to make sure that the hostages will be home and the sooner the better i know that as we speak uh there are a lot of whatever either rumor rumors fake news or or anything in between um that is trying that are discussing trying to discuss what is it actually that hamas is offering us and what do we agree to I'm not holding the details so far. Um, and I believe that the fact that the country and a lot of the people that are dealing, it, dealing with it, I mean, from the prime minister to the cabinet, uh, to the uh, wars cabinet, and, and of course the head of the organization, Mossad Shabak, and, and the, the intelligence uh, of the army, the IDF intelligence forces, everybody's trying to deal with it based on our intelligence that we're holding about the hostages. Is trying to get us the best deal ever. I emphasized again and again and again, even publicly, that this is next to the war is a a target uh, number one. We don't have target number one and two. We have target one number one, target one number two. There's are eventually similar targets to me. We have to get our hostages back home, and the sooner the better because of the bad conditions that they're in. Another question that was often raised. Um, is about Qatar. Um, so many people have asked me about what do you think about the Qataris? I said, okay, maybe you have some questions mark question marks about who are they and what they do and what is their role, not only for me, their historic role about them keeping Hamas alive on or on their feet. My answer to these would be that all these question marks should be very well kept some time to the future, because the only honest and capable um, mitigator that we have currently are the Qataris. And if we were losing them, not to be part of what we so much need, it would be terrifying, terrible situation to even start negotiating um, uh, in between another uh, mitigator that I don't really believe that there is anyone without the Qataris. So to all the questions that are we dealing with the right person? Are we dealing with the right country? Is Qatar involved in terrorism or not? Uh, what do we do in American universities with the Qatari support? I mean, there are a bunch of questions that I, I truly believe that has to be eventually so very well kept or pushed into the future. We can do that absolutely later. And that was my um, um, honest and, and very deep uh, concern from the beginning, what do we do and how do we make sure that we do negotiate uh, and we do negotiate for the uh, sake of the hostages and I found uh, the Qataris like all the time, every time in the past, very effective. I truly hope that we are building right now a kind of a reasonable deal that the country, I mean Israel, could accept and that will bring our hostages back home. There's another thing that you're dealing with, um, and I I can't thank you enough for your huge contribution as the people of JNF and the people that are active at this uh, very uh, uh, important organization is the future of the settlements around Gaza Strip. I know that you are are deeply busy with the reconstruction of these um, uh, settlements, and I. Take this opportunity to thank you for what you, you what you're doing the last dozens of years, and eventually from October seventh to make sure that um, these settlements will keep on um, creating life um, and the future. I think that it is the time to move on to the north, uh, with your permission, and this is something that has to be eventually discussed because many questions will be raised about what do we do with Hezbollah. I mean, it's an organization that you probably know. 
that you've heard about, which is in a kind of a conflict on a different uh, scale today, different than what it was in the past. Hezbollah is bigger, much bigger than Hamas by numbers, by military capabilities, by the numbers of rockets and precision guided missiles and rockets that they're holding. Um, we are trying, again, with American uh, American help, uh, Amos uh, 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 Hochstein is, is, is working intensively to try to bring the Hezbollah back to the understandings that were at the end of what we, will, what we call the Second Lebanon War in 2006. And this is the UN decision 1701. I truly believe that if the state of Israel will eventually um, enter a full scale, full fledged conflict with Hezbollah, we will defeat Hezbollah, of course. I mean, the, the gaps in between their capacities and ours are is huge. Um, and I, I think that the, with not much fear, uh, we can do and we conduct another intensive front with Hezbollah if decided. My recommendation would be not to do it right now because I think that we're totally split in between so many efforts inside the state of Israel and of course in Gaza Strip. And because of this, the terrible situation that we are uh, facing today, I would recommend my uh, government, and so I did, to hold it and to try to get into diplomatic solution for that time. Again, do we have to treat Hezbollah sometime in the in the future? Do we have to fit to, to defeat them sometime in the future? Do we have to make sure that they will cease to exist sometime in the future? The answer for all these questions is absolutely yes. But I'm not sure that this is the right time to do it unless Hezbollah choose uh, to escalate the existing conflict to a complete war. Then they will find our beautiful F-35s and other capabilities, and thank you very much, American citizens, for um, let let us have this uh, very important strategic um, um, armaments and capabilities to defeat our very uh, uh, bitter enemies in the northern part of of the state. I want to refer to Iran um, by saying and stating that Iran is behind all this. Without the Iranian financial aid to the Islamic Jihad, to the Hamas, to the Hezbollah, to the Revolutionary Guards, which is part of the Iranian regime, all of that could not have eventually been either built or existing. And this is something that has to be remembered when on one ear, we listen to how um, Iran is dangerous to the existence of the state of Israel, not now, but maybe sometime in the future when, well, they, I hope they will never get that, but if they will, unfortunately, decide to go into the nuclear bomb path, um, it, it is something that reminds us all the time, again, how dangerous Iran e is. On the other ear, we hear, why don't we get another deal with Iran that eventually would lift off all American and international sanctions so we can have another deal that would stop them from acquiring a nuclear bomb. My humble opinion is, and it was for so many time, uh, for so long time, I'm sorry, is that we should always remember that Iran is not only dealing with nuclear stuff, which is eventually a dangerous thing to our existence again, if they will acquire a nuclear bomb, but more than that, I think that Iran has to be treated as one of the most dangerous countries, not only to the state of Israel, but to the entire region. My friends from the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, according to foreign reports, and to the others that we've signed already, the Abraham Accords, Iran is the first enemy too. Therefore, you see a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, agreements and understandings in between these nations and the Iranians themselves, so to make sure that Iran will be pushed away from its motivation to harm them nations in, in the Gulf area too. But for us, Iran is not speaking to us, not directly and not indirectly. Therefore, the state of Israel should be all the time prepared, totally prepared to strike in Iran 
if Iran is eventually going to the nuclear military nuclear path, or to make sure in between us and our important allies, including the USA, that Iran will never be forgiven for what they are doing, mainly, mainly not to lift off the sanctions that were lifted when the JCPOA, the first uh, Iranian nuclear deal, was signed. As an Israeli citizen, um, as a Jewish, um, the, the part of a Jewish family and country and, and nation, I think that we have um, faced a different threat and different level of brutality from Hamas on the 7th of October. But we've learned some good stuff too. We've learned that the Israeli society is super strong. We've learned that if not being split by the others, we're so united to defeat our enemies and to overcome all local problems that we had before that. One more important thing that we've learned is the importance of the American support. And I can't thank you guys enough and President Biden, of course, for what you did and for what he did personally. I mean, showing here, um, I mean, presenting himself in at the same front as the state of Israel, threatening our enemies with this famous thing that we call don't or just don't, uh, was a very significant thing that I believe will push um, our enemies' motivation uh, from uh, further attacking the state of Israel uh, currently. And I think that the statement that came all the way from the White House to Jerusalem uh, was super important. And again, I thank you and I thank uh, America for standing together with the Jewish communities with our uh, quite suffering country um, at the current time. Thank you very much. So, Yossi, uh, first of all, thank you for what you do for our country uh, in Israel. And, uh, you know, our condolences for the loss of your two cousins. And Thank you. Uh, obviously, to everyone who has had a loss and family member who's had a loss. I will I'll just uh, end this by saying, first of all, thank you for your time. I know how busy you are. But, you know, the JNF USA is running these um, volunteer missions with uh, overwhelming response. And... Uh, Everybody we speak to, the Israeli citizens, have such a spirit. It, I mean, it's incredible uh, that uh, the spirit they have in the time of war and uh, ready to rebuild and go back. Are, are we just getting exposed to a limited number of uh, people who have that spirit, or are you seeing that nationwide? I, I, I mean, I, mean I, I do see many people that I'm working with the hostages families, I'm working with the army, I'm working with, I uh, try to work better with the, with, with the uh, of course, with the uh, financial institutions in Israel to make sure that our economy is okay, um, that in our economy will survive all that. And I see it on the streets and I see it with my family. I mean, there are tons of super optimistic motivation from within the Israeli society. The only one thing that I'm a little bit worried about, to tell the truth, Saul, is that it has to be um, maintained after the war. I mean, the last thing I want to see is what we saw last year, I mean, the beginning of 2023, that we had like kind of two Israeli blocks, I mean, from two good size, sides, okay, arguing each other to a to my understanding, to a dangerous level. And I believe that maybe this is another good thing that we see, that the Israeli society has a lot in it and could co contribute from now on more and more to that uh, sake.